So I just got back from seeing Ant-Man and the Wasp. Uh, it comes out here in Thailand on Wednesdays. I was able to go see it this afternoon. And I was actually pretty surprised. I had pretty low expectations. Uh, I saw the first Ant-Man and I wasn't that big of a fan. I was kind of disappointed because I really like Paul Rudd. And seeing him as Ant-Man in the first one, I don't know, it just didn't really work for me. I, he, in, he reminded me a bit, I mean, obviously Ant-Man came out before the first Jurassic World, I think. <laughs> but uh, Chris Pratt in Jurassic World, Paul Rudd in the first Ant-Man, they both felt kind of wooden. They felt toned down and more serious. And I, I believe it was how they were directed possibly they were trying to get away from more of their stereotypical roles more of that goofy uh, sidekick type of person and be more of a leading man it just I don't know it, it didn't really work for me in the first one I wasn't bad it wasn't a terrible movie but I just wasn't that big of a fan so going into this one I kind of expected more of the same I thought oh it'll be It'll be a solid, you know, just run-of-the-mill Marvel movie. It's not going to be great. It won't be terrible. And it was better than that. It still wasn't great. But it was good. It was fun. Uh, Paul Rudd had a lot more of his personality come through in this one. He actually had quite a few good jokes. Um, actually, before I get into it, I should say... I'm going to I'm going to talk full spoilers. I know a lot of people haven't seen it. My theory is you click on a video, click on a podcast, and it has the title of the movie in in the title and it like clearly says we're talking about this thing. I don't it's your own fault if it gets spoiled. I'm sorry. <laughs> Spoiler-free reviews seem kind of pointless to me because it's really just a an ad for their spoiler review they're all they end up doing is saying like and then one person did this thing that affected this other person that did this thing and then because of that thing they all had to come together and do this other thing but we'll talk about it more next week when we do our spoiler free and it's like what's what's the point so anyways not going to do that just going to talk about the movie um so if you don't want it spoiled just turn it off now i'm not gonna I'm not going to break down the entire plot. I'm not going to go through beat by beat. But I'm sure I'll say things that will spoil the movie in one way or another. Fair warning, spoiler alert, whatever. Just I just want to get that out of the way. But like I was saying, Paul Rudd was great in this. I thought he did a really good job. I felt like his personality shined through way more than it did in the first one. And I think that's because it's something that Taylor and I talked about on the podcast a while ago. He's much better as a sidekick. The first Ant-Man was kind of his movie, right? He was the leading the leading character in that movie. This one felt much more like Evangeline Lilly was the lead, at least in the action scenes. And so she was the one kind of taking care of business, getting things done, which gave him a lot more room to be inadequate, to be dumb, to not know what's going on. And to be more of that goofy sidekick role. Even though I I know it's his movie, I know he's, you know, the leading man and all that. But he he fits so much better in that when it's not all on his shoulders. Not him as an actor, but him his character. When other people can be more serious and he can be the comic relief to them. And so I thought him and Evangeline Lilly were great working side by side in this. She she was so believable in her role, in her abilities, in everything that she was doing. I, I really wish they would use more, that they would have more characters, female characters, along these lines. I think she is a, she's a good, strong character. She, you know, she's confident. She's capable. And she doesn't feel forced. She doesn't feel pandering. There's never a moment of... She did it because she's a woman. It was, she did it because she's experienced. She's capable. She's smart. She's spent time. She's done things. And her gender has nothing to do with it. I don't think, I don't, I don't like when people treat, you know, gender or race or anything like that 
as the reason why someone is able to do something because that's not really true you train you you work hard you invest your time you get better at whatever you're trying to do and she was she her character fits so well with that role and i just i, I really enjoyed seeing her in that uh michael pena was back in this one and i was a little worried because he was the comic relief in the first one and he was great super funny all his jokes all his bits were you know the best parts of the last movie and i was worried they're going to go to that well too often that they're going to keep you know using him to break the tension and just be funny and that didn't really happen which i was which i was happy about he's he's in this one a lot more he shows up and he helps out a lot more than he did in the first one but he didn't feel like he was being overutilized um they did do his quick speech where uh i think he in the first one he was breaking down their heist like this is what we're gonna do this is what you're gonna say and they would cut back and they would show all the characters talking but using his voice and it's a pretty funny moment in the first one i knew they were gonna do that in this one and i, I was nervous about that but what they did is one of the bad guys gives him truth serum and the truth serum is the the reason or the motivation behind why he starts talking like that and why he starts doing that and that makes so much sense to reuse that thing but in a different way not it doesn't feel like oh this people really enjoyed this in the first one let's just do that again it there was like a logical reason for why that was happening and i i really appreciated that um lawrence lawrence fishburne is in this movie and he is uh, michael douglas's old partner from back in the day and he comes in and he's a solid character um he's trying to help the the villain ghost get you know put back together because she when she was a kid she was affected by the quantum realm because of an explosion and her whole body is torn apart and she's you know she's able to phase through things and that's part of her what makes her scary is that she can just walk through walls and you know jump through cars and do all this stuff he's trying to help her get back to normal to get fixed to to not be this quantum i don't even know what to call it ghost i guess um and his motivation to help her was really strong to the point you know you you bought it you got you understood why he was doing it him and michael douglas hated each other and yet they bump into each other a few times and it's you you feel like oh yeah they they definitely know each other they've you know they have this past history that is causing conflict now but also resolving the conflict which is something that I feel like doesn't happen a lot in movies where people can hate each other but not you know not have moments of I, I there was a reason why I liked you like they 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 don't have those moments of looking past their struggles and remembering their old relationship and actually helping each other out and that happens in this movie a few times where they're working against each other working with each other helping each other out double crossing each other and I, I just I really enjoyed that character that that dynamic between those characters uh, they felt like there was some actual stakes but not just you know to move the plot forward but to you know something that's logical to life you know these characters feel lived in they don't feel like they're written just for this moment which is pretty refreshing you know like it gets really boring when everything that's happening just feels like oh it's to you know push the the plot forward or to keep the plot on track and that's that's not how life is you know you have things in your life that is going to distract you from your goals from your missions and it's you know there's going to be things that get in the way and there's going to be things that help you get it done and you don't get to force that <laughs> you know there's there's a logical reason for why that stuff's happening even if you don't know it there's a reason why whatever happened that affected your life and it this movie felt like it was very focused 
on having good motivations for the characters and for events. There's one scene when, uh, in the beginning, Scott has this hallucination, this dream, uh, and we find out later that it's actually um, Hank Pym's wife, Evangeline Lilly's mom, contacting him from the the quantum realm. Because in the end of the first movie, Scott Lang, Paul Rudd's character, goes into the quantum realm and, you know, gets this quantum, uh, what do they call it, quantum connection, I I remember, um, but they're, they're connected, and it's like, oh, really? Like, you're just going to throw this in here with no reference to this in the first one? There's never any, any, any point in the first movie where you felt like, oh, he's got a connection with her mom now, or with Hank Pym's wife, and it, it felt very forced and, uh, you know, like, kind of like they were, you know, manipulating everything to make it work for the story. And this happens within like first five minutes or so, first ten minutes, and I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, this is not going to go well. This is it's already starting off on a bad foot." And we find out that the reason why it happened when it did, and not within the two years of time since he went into the quantum realm, was because uh, Hank Pym and Evangeline Lilly's character opened a portal to the quantum realm. And she was able to contact him right when that happened. And that was kind of the inciting incident that moved this, that got this story going. And it's like, oh, okay, that that actually makes a lot of sense. That they had the door open for, you know, a split second. And she was able to contact him and he was able to contact them. He called them. He was like, hey, I don't know what's going on. I just had this weird dream. And, you know, things started moving. So the part of the story was because of everything that happened in civil war him getting arrested he is on house arrest two years he can't leave the house he's got an ankle bracelet and he's just stuck at home evangeline lily and hank pym uh they both hate him now because he ran off to germany i think it was wherever wherever civil war happened where the big fight happened and he didn't contact them he took the suit and he told them that the suit got destroyed and all this different stuff and so they were just like you know what you're you're not worth being around and so when that the vision happens and he calls them they're like oh well we gotta figure out what he knows and if he can figure out where she is and the rest of the movie is them trying to find hank pym's wife and get her out of the quantum realm uh spoiler they do it and it's it's pretty good um i don't really enjoy the quantum realm stuff it's all visual type stuff and i had the same thing with dr strange it's it's cool but i don't know i feel like it's it's not really that interesting to look at for me at least it's just like it's all sparkly and different colors and all this stuff going on and it's just I don't know. Maybe if you're high, it might be <laughs> more enjoyable, but it's not really been my case. But anyways, um, so yeah, uh, that, I was talking about Lawrence Fishburne. Uh, he yeah, he did a good job. He was helping out Hannah John Cammon. I think that's how you say her name. And she was the ghost. She was a girl who got uh, affected by the quantum explosion. And now I was able to phase through things. And I'm, earlier I was talking about how I enjoyed Evangeline Lilly being this strong female character. Because I don't, I don't like focusing on the genders with that stuff. Uh, if they're sh- like a good character, I, I really don't care if they're sh- female or male. But when they're a bad female character, they really stand out. So I, I, I want to make sure I d- notice when they're good i guess i i don't know uh ghost was great i thought she was menacing i thought she she made sense why she was doing what she was doing she was she was a villain she was doing bad things to try to save her life and so her motivation to be the antagonist to ant-man to evangeline lily makes complete sense 
even to the point where you're like somewhat on her side of yeah okay that i get it like you (laughs) you're dying you're in constant pain you don't want to do that you're gonna try really hard not to do that and there's a scene with her and Lawrence fishburne where uh ant-man and the whole crew get away and they have to find him again and she's like well he's got a daughter i'll just get his daughter and then we will we'll get him back and Lawrence fishburne's like no (laughs) you know i i've been supporting you i've you know i've sat back and allowed you or been okay with you doing a lot of things that are questionable but if you do that i'm done i'm not helping you and she needs him because he's a scientist who can help save her life and she's conflicted she's like okay well i'll figure something else out and it's you you make your villains relatable understandable and you make a much better villain you can't just have pure evil just blanket pure evil it is so boring there's if you can't relate to the villain at all you really don't the movie really doesn't mean that much like you think about uh, some of the greatest villains uh heath ledger as a joker and yeah he's crazy and he's doing all this stuff but you kind of get it you kind of can follow along even though his logic is bad you can still kind of like i see it you know you you're not just crazy there's something there's something to what you're saying and you need that element to have a compelling villain and i thought ghost was great i thought she's one of the better villains i think marvel has ever had and i don't know that i mean it's not saying a ton because a lot of them are, are really bad but I, I i really enjoyed her um some of the other characters though were not very good in my opinion i i thought michael douglas was kind of bored throughout he uh i don't know he he never felt that believable he never felt like he was really into it like i felt like the performances around him were really strong and his was kind of flat which i i don't know much about hank pym as a character maybe he's just always been kind of a you know wet blanket type character and that's that's kind of pushing it to it's them that might be a stretch calling him a wet blanket but he's just just kind of boring and uh i don't know if he is supposed to be or if michael douglas was playing him that way i don't know if it was intentional or if it was just kind of lazy but it it i didn't enjoy when he was on screen i he I don't know. I mean, his motivations as a character were good. He was trying to get his wife back out of the quantum realm and all that, but it wasn't interesting to watch. Uh, Walton Goggins was in this. And I, I generally... I, Walton Goggins is really hit and miss for me. Um, he does creepy Southerner really, really well. Really hard... To not just see him as that. To not see him as the guy from Hateful Eight. The guy from uh, was it Justified. Is that right? Uh, I feel like that's right, but that's not. I don't even think that's what I'm thinking of. Um, it's, so it's just hard to separate him from those type of characters. And in this, I did not understand why he was doing anything he was doing him he was like the leader of this gang who was coming after evangeline Lilly and hank pym because they wanted hank pym's brain basically or i mean they wanted hank pym to help make technology for them so they could sell it on the black market they didn't want to do that they just needed to buy stuff from them to be able to get uh, hank pym's wife out of the quantum realm and so they he tries to steal money from them he's like he was going to sell him something and he said but your your dad he's talking to evangeline lily your dad has to work with me and she's like well that's not going to happen and he's like well just consider this money that you're going to give me for this machine payment as my hurt feelings like compensation for my hurt feelings and she's like you know it's going to be a lot easier if we you just give me what i'm buying and he's like nope 
So she goes out, gets her wasp suit on, comes and, you know, beats everyone up. And I thought this was a really good action scene. I, I enjoyed all the action scenes for the most part. Um, they're all like really well done. The effects were very impressive, similar to the first. It was very creative. Sometimes the shrinking and growing stuff got overly repetitive, like the, especially with the building. I mean, it's in the trailer, but every time they shrink and make it bigger, it's like it happens like five times, and it just felt a bit much. Like I don't know, and it doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, so Walton Goggins' guys and him get all beat up by her. She gets the part she needs, but they keep showing back up. They keep coming back and causing problems and trying to steal the building. They want the building. And I don't know. Like, they were so outclassed in that first fight. It's hard for me to believe that they would be willing to keep jumping back in and getting beat up. They were just nonstop going for what they wanted. And kind of what I was saying earlier about making a compelling villain you need they need to be somewhat relatable this guy didn't make any sense like I, I just didn't get it i didn't see it felt like that first fight when she took out i don't know 10 guys in two minutes whatever it was seems like oh that yeah we so we we got lucky that was it like there's no reason for us to keep trying this but they do over and over and over and it, it just the the reasoning behind what they're doing never was ever clear enough or wasn't strong enough. I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure if I missed something or just them wanting Hank Pym to work with them or to get his technology. That was enough because they just wanted money. Uh, but I, don't, I didn't care for them. And then the worst character, in my opinion, was Randall Park, the Asian guy who played Jim in The Office for that one episode. I think he's on a Fox TV show off the boat something like that fresh off the boat I don't I don't remember um, he was yeah he was not very good he was playing it very um, uh, comedically like he, I don't know I, I'm having a hard time pinpointing what I really didn't like about him but he was he was supposed to be was he FBI? Yeah, FBI agent. But he was always just like so jokey and dumb and like fell for everything. And so uh, Scott Lang is under house arrest and they are checking on him uh, at any time his ankle bracelet goes off. And it goes off like three or four times. And he's busts into the house and gets fooled super easy. And I don't know. It, he... Anytime he was on screen, I was just kind of cringing. It, I, I didn't enjoy him. Um, I, d I don't think it's necessarily his fault. I don't know whose choice it was for his character to be that way. I don't think he's like a bad actor or anything like that. I just, the character being comedic was too much. Uh, I enjoyed that there was fewer uh, comedic characters in this movie compared to something like Civil War, where it kind of seemed like everyone had to have a quippy moment or you know something even if it wasn't quippy they needed to have their moment to shine and this one felt gave a lot more room for ant-man i mean obviously it's his movie but anytime randall park was on screen he kind of sucked all the energy off out of it because he was trying to be jokey and uh it just wasn't landing so that was that was kind of frustrating but um was one of the things I've been wondering, you know, just with Ant-Man in general, and if you understand or you know, if you can explain it to me, I'd appreciate it. But my understanding of Ant-Man's powers is when he shrinks, he still has the same amount of mass. So as a tiny Ant-Man, tiny ant person or whatever, the, as a tiny ant <laughs> uh, if he punches you, it's exactly like getting punched by a full-size person. And so they'll shrink, get momentum, 
and get bigger to have extra power, right? So I believe that's correct. I think that is consistent with his character. I think it's consistent with what the first movie tells you. When he gets big, when he becomes, you know, giant man, um, shouldn't he still have the same mass? Shouldn't he still be as strong as a single man? I don't understand how he can, you know, stop a car and do all this other stuff when he's giant. Because I feel like he's just big, <laughs> just big, you know, like you imagine getting hit with a, um, a beach ball in the face. Would you rather have it full of air or deflated so it's just flat and it's just, you know, stiffer and, you know, more condensed? Obviously, you'd rather have it inflated. So it seems like Giant Man would be that. This huge person who is only, you know, the same mass as a guy who's 145 pounds. I don't know what, <laughs> 200 pounds, somewhere in between there. I don't think he's 200 pounds. But, you know, that, that that's always kind of confused me. How, how does that work? Why does getting bigger help? Um... So the, like I was saying before, the story felt logical. It felt like a good, a good continuation from the first movie. Hey, grips. Um, it didn't feel. It felt. It, it didn't feel necessary, but it didn't feel unnecessary, which is huge because most uh, sequels feel very forced especially in the beginning they gotta re-enter you back into this world and justify why you're back and it it just rarely ever works and with ant-man this ant-man and the wasp the justification of coming back into the story really worked they they kept consistent logic of why they're telling the story and the motivations for all the characters and why they were in the positions they were in and why they wanted to do what they did. Happy birthday, Nick Ruggs. Ruggs? Nugs? I don't have my glasses on. I got terrible eyes. Ergs. Ergs? <laughs> I, I don't know. It's Ergs, right? Happy birthday, Nick Ergs. Is that what you're saying? I feel like I'm saying that wrong. Ergs does not seem like a last name. Sorry, Nick, if that is your last name. But uh, yeah, so everything that happened in the previous movies carried over into this one. You know, he had consequences from fighting with Captain America in Civil War. He had, uh, you know, his relationship with Evangeline Lilly. There was carryover from that. Things just felt like what happened in previous movies actually mattered in this one and his relationship with his daughter that motivation because he he's very much driven by the idea of you know being a good dad and teaching her that you know that how to be a good person and that core motivation in the middle of his character is consistent he makes choices that are to teach her to show her how to be good and how not to, you know, just kind of be useless as a person. And I, I, I thought that was really good. Um, although, you know, I did say the justification of getting back into the story was good. I hated it. made me so upset that they would start uh, with present day in the as the title screen of the movie, because this is taking place before infinity war so if you see infinity war if you watch these in chronological order infinity war happens thanos snaps his uh the uh infinity gauntlet people start disappearing turning into ash all right grips take it easy and they <laughs> they start this movie with present day except it's in the past of the storyline of the movie and what are you supposed to take from that you know I don't know. It, 
I mean, they they start off a little bit with him telling a story or Hank Pym telling a story, but it was clear that it was him telling a story. Like it, it was very annoying. It was a very annoying way <laughs> to do that. Um, but yeah, so speaking of Thanos, this is at the end. They they save Hank Pym's wife from the quantum realm. Everyone is, you know, happy. The ghost is taken care of. They've figured out how to help her out. Everything's good. They start, <laughs> uh, come on, be happy, I think is the song that's playing. I don't know if that's the actual title, but it's that... Um, that old song that is played in a lot of things but there everything is like aggressively happy and everyone's everything's working out everyone is good and so i was like okay well here's where the snap is gonna happen it's they're they're like projecting it way too much like oh everyone's good everything's happy and then they don't do it and the credits start rolling and i was like oh that's weird then they have the first mid credit scene, and uh, Scott Lang goes back into the quantum realm to get healing, quantum healing power. I don't, I don't know what that is, but for Ghost, and then while he's in there, Hank Pym, Evangeline Lilly's character, and Hank Pym's wife all turn into ash. So now Scott Lang is trapped in the quantum realm. Everyone else is turned into ash, and. I assume it's going to be a conflict for Scott Lang of being stuck there. There's also a chance that he just gets out. I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. But I was pretty disappointed that that's how they wanted to tie it together in a mid credit scene when it just felt kind of toothless because you could have... You, you reunite <laughs> Evangeline Lilly and you know the, her character and her mom and you know Hank Pym and his wife and there's this big emotional scene with them getting back together. Um, Scott Lang is off house arrest and he's with his daughter and there's so much stuff that's happening positively and I, I kind of feel like this might have been where they're going but they changed their mind. But that's when the snap should have happened. When everything was at the, the peak, you take it away. Because it just, I, it felt like if you're going to do it, just go all the way. Like, make his daughter disappear in front of him. Make the mom disappear. Make Hank disappear. Like, take, take it away and make it mean something. None of the characters were affected in that moment because uh, Scott is in the quantum realm. He doesn't know what happened. And all three of uh the pims turned into ash so no one suffered no one knows you don't get to you don't get to experience that and i think they're just hoping to play off of the emotion of infinity war your the audience you know emotion of like oh that sucked when that happened and so they like just kind of toss it in there but it, it just felt like so wasted to do it that way and then you watch the rest of the credits to the post credit scene and it is dumb. It was just a giant ant playing the electric drums. Uh, they, uh, they used an ant to pretend to be Scott when he had to wear his ankle monitor, which I didn't like. I thought that was all dumb, but that ant gets back in the house and plays the drums because he was copying his, his daily routine. And it felt just like don't even put in a post credit scene if that's what you're going to do. Like they had the Ant-Man and the Wasp will return, but with a question mark, which I don't think they did a question mark in Infinity War. Uh, but I don't remember. I wasn't paying attention well enough to know 100%. But I thought that was interesting that they would put a question mark. Um, they're definitely going to be back. But that really should have just been it. Just go cut to that. Don't post credit scenes. If you're going to do stuff like that, it's just like this dumb little moment that doesn't mean anything to anybody, just don't put it in. I don't know. I'm sure kids probably think it's funny, so that's fine, I guess. But I was a little disappointed with that. But uh, overall, 
it's actually pretty good. It's not my top Marvel movie or anything. It's but it's not it's it's better than average. It's you know, it, it's somewhere in between average and great. And uh it's way better than I expected. But yeah, so let me know what you guys think of uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Let me know what you think of Ant-Man in general. And if you understand how the giant man powers work, I'd really like to have that explained to me because I have no idea. But, uh, yeah, we'll be back. Uh, I, sh- I should have a podcast coming out with Sean Chandler from Chandler. Sean Chandler Talks About Things. He does movie reviews and all this stuff coming out tomorrow or the next day. We talked about Rocky. It was, it was a lot of fun. So look out for that, and uh, we'll be back.